Carolyn, certainly appreciate that uh, introduction. So good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to session four of the South Carolina SBDC Intellectual Property Webinar Series. And thank you for joining us today. My name is Tony Del Campo. I am the technology business consultant in the Charleston region of the South Carolina SBDC, and I'll be the moderator for today. For those not familiar with the South Carolina Small Business Development Center, we are a statewide organization that serves the needs of both urban and rural businesses. SBDC consultants work with small businesses at all stages of development by offering free consulting assistance to help existing businesses grow, as well as assist entrepreneurs and innovators who wish to establish a startup. We do this through one-on-one -on -one consulting with companies, as well as offer useful educational training seminars, such as these IP webinars to inform businesses that they can be positioned for commercial success. Over the past three weeks, these IP webinars, uh, we have covered several IP topics to inform small businesses owners and entrepreneurs on the importance of intellectual property to their business operations. Today's session will cover design around strategies and will be presented by Doug Lineberry, a patent attorney at Burr Foreman. Doug will cover important strategies that inventors can implement in writing their patent applications to avoid infringement issues down the road. As Carolyn mentioned, I'm the moderator and I'll be managing the chat box that you see in the corner of your screen. And if you have questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat box. And we hope to have time at the end of the webinar to respond to your questions. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to today's presenter of webinar session four, Doug Lineberry. Excellent, thank you, Tony. Hopefully everyone can see now the beginning of my slides as I click them in the presentation mode. And today, everyone, what we're going to cover is a, a very strong topic for IP. You don't see this talked about a lot. You don't even see it mentioned a whole lot. Um, this is something for the advanced IP practitioner. This is something for a customer, a client, a business that sees a potential roadblock and wants to figure out a way around it. Um, what we want to do today is we're going to discuss design around strategy. We want to walk away with a key vocabulary. We also want to know when do you need one, and also if you do need one, what do you do to implement? Uh, let's start out with a quote. Uh, really, the one thing that everybody forgets about a patent is that the claims are the bounds and scope of it. Everything else is advertised. And that, to put it succinctly, says the protected invention is what the claim says it is. Infringement can be avoided by avoiding the language of the claim. And that's an oversimplification, but by gosh, it nails it on the head. Because what we want to know today is we are here to look at the claims. We're not here to look at any particular claim, but the independent claims. We want to make certain we avoid those. And what we want to do is to eliminate an element. We want to be able to say, hey, if somebody comes to knocking later on about a patented device, we can look them square in the eye and say, look, your claims require these five items. I've only got four, three, two, one, or none of those. That's our in process for this. And you're asking yourself, why would this be particularly important to me? Infringement lawsuits are incredibly expensive. If someone were to come at you with an infringement cease and demand, you would want to be able to say, hey, I don't infringe. Here are the reasons I don't infringe. And remember that infringement occurs in a lot of ways. You can make a device, you can use it, you can offer it to sell, you can sell it, or you can import it. And this is good for physical devices as well as systems and methods. Um, also, an important thing to remember though is when you're filing for your patents or patent application, those paper documents, i.e. a patent or i.e. a patent application, they don't infringe something else. There has to be something that carries out those claims. Just having another piece of paper that talks about those, that is a patent application that becomes a patent, is not sufficient for infringement. You need to make the device, use it, offer it to sell, sell it, or actually import it, or a process that embodies that device. That's how you infringe. Now, another thing for our vocabulary today is to understand what a pending application is. Pending means a lot. It means it's at the U.S. Patent Office right now. We can go look at it. If it's older than 18 months, we can figure out what's going on in the history of it. We can really have a look into it, unless there's been a non-publication. But what we don't have are situations where if a patent's issued or if it's on abandoned. 
those are not pending. They are no longer alive in patent. And so when we talk about pending today, understand we mean alive. We understand that mean a patent a patent office that is currently extant. We might be able to actually bring clones of that patent, whether a con, maybe the SIP, which is a clone that has some new stuff added to it. But that pending application has a lot of opportunity, both pro and con, for an infringement. Next, when we talk about the parts of the patent, let's understand that really the claim is penultimate. Everything else is just advertised. Now, when we talk about the patent of the application, it's based of very important parts, the claims being one of those. The specification, that explains what it is, how it works, how you make it. The drawings, lo and behold, it shows it. The description itself, the detailed description specifically, goes into the nuts and bolts of that particular invention. But the claims, and again, the claims, guys, I cannot understate, and I cannot emphasize enough how important this is. You need to remember that those claims are the meets and bounds. They explain what that patent protects. They explain what someone can try to enforce. Now, we do have two types of claims in a patent. You have an independent claim, which really doesn't refer to any others. Typically, claim one's almost always one. I've seen a couple funky patents where claim one will refer to somebody else. But for the most part, independent uh, claim one is the way to start off on this. A dependent claim actually refers to another claim by number. It'll say, as in claim two, or the you can have a claim seven. It says the process of claim one wherein blah, blah, blah. And so remember, those dependent claims always refer back to another claim. An independent claim does not. Uh, typically, when you file an application, you're given three independent claims for free. And so you can have a total of 20 with 17 dependent tacked on. And what you will typically see is people use those. Now, you probably will have in a good patent application multiple independent claims because you want to describe those inventions in different ways. And today, for a design around discussion, we need to be particularly concerned with all of the independent claims that have to do with that device. And also remember that it might just not be a single patent. There may be two, three, four patents that cover this device. We want to make certain that if we're looking how to design around, that we make certain we design around the independent claims that refer to that device in all of those patents. If we do not, maybe we knock two or three off the table, but look, here's this dangling fourth patent we didn't do anything about its independent claims. And here comes an infringement cease and desist letter. There comes a lawsuit. We want to make certain that we cover this complete. And it requires a lot of homework. It does require us to know what this other invention is, to know its full family relationship. Are there other patents? Are there foreign patents? Are there things that may come back in the U.S. that we need to worry about later? So there's really like a family tree aspect of a design around that a lot of people don't appreciate. Now, what we have to do, and I mentioned earlier that what we want to do is to knock out an element. That's exactly what our intent is. We want to be able to say, hey, we don't do each and every step or element or what it is you require in your independent claim. We just don't do that. That is your ultimate goal for a design room. Now, what we don't want to do is to stumble into a trap called the doctrine of equivalence. And that's where we, we take an element and we say, oh, well, we don't have this element. But if our device were to accomplish the same principle in the same way, we can essentially be found to be equivalent to that missing element. So this is something to um, keep in mind when we're doing a design patent, or I'm sorry, when we're doing a design around, is to make certain that we don't intentionally or unintentionally fall into the doctrine of equivalence by trying to remove something from that origin. We want to make certain that we're distinct from it. We want to be able to say that we don't have element three. And we don't have something that accomplishes element three somewhere else in the invention. Maybe we call it a widget. We don't want something like that there that will inexorably do what should have been accomplished by that thing we said that we knocked out. Now, guys, what I want us to know about this is that there's absolutely nothing wrong with trying to design around. It's encouraged. One of the key tenets of our society is, hey, we want you to incentivize. We want you to design. And guess what? If you try to design around somebody's patent, that lowers the chances of a willfulness determination. Willfulness would be when you saw someone else's um, device or method and said, hey, I'm going to do that. I, I like what they're doing. They're making money off of it. I'm going to do it. That gang can come back to haunt you. Uh, it could trigger triple damages. It could also have you paying the attorney's fees for that side. You don't want any of those. 
If you can show that you made attempts to design around it, again, guys, this is encouraged. This is something that the U.S. system is like, go ahead and do this. It's okay because it encourages you to additionally innovate. It encourages you to be different than that box. And, but what we don't want to do is to be in a situation where we have not taken those steps, went out on the market with a widget that's like somebody else's stuff. That will get us in trouble. And again, intentional design arounds are here to avoid infringement. And guess what? They're beneficial because they cause you to have to think of a way to redesign something, a design around. Now, another item I want you to look at is when we talk about the spec of the patent. We're going to talk about the drawing. They're going to show you what it's like. We're going to show you the summary of the invention. Very general restatement of claims. Don't get bogged down with those. They're there to simply kind of put the claims in plain English. They are not the claims. They don't count as the claims. So don't try to use those in your design around. That detailed description, you'd be shocked at how many people see something in a detailed description and think, oh, wow, I can't do that for my device. That's entirely wrong. The detailed description cannot be in print. All it is is the advertising, as it were, for how the patent works or how this method is accomplished or how you build this device. The parts that get you are the claims. That's the numbered segments at the end of the patent application. Everything else above it, just kind of advertising or explanation. That's the best way to think of it. But the claims, those are the heart and soul. That's what you have to worry about for your design. Now, guys, I cannot enforce this enough. The claims, the claims, the claims. You will have so many people come to you and be like, oh my gosh, this patent says blah, blah, blah in the detailed description. I can't do that. That's not what that means. It means that that description helps them to enable their invention, to make it so others can do that once that patent lapses. But I want you to be certain that you understand that it is the claims that we are concerned about for design design, not the detailed description the claim. Also, a patent application, guys, is not an issued patent. It doesn't yet have issued claims, just hoped for claims, prospective claims that they hope that they can get. So when you're looking at those, you need to understand that, hey, designing around those is a good thing, but also understand that that is not the final claim, that we're going to have to keep an eye on those claims to see what happens to them. Um, a couple ways that may help you with the design around patent prosecution estoppel, Meaning that, hey, the inventor of this other widget told the patent office, my device isn't this. If you can do the isn't this for your device to get around their claims, that's great. But it rarely happens in patents. Uh, same with patent specifications saying that, hey, my device is not this, or it doesn't do this this way. Again, you don't see a lot of that in there. Mostly we try to write our patent applications very broad. Now, one thing we will tell you is that, hey, if your device can do the prior art, meaning what's known in your industry, it's already out there, if you can use that to replace one of these elements of the claim, do it. Because the prior art's the prior art. It's already out there. It can't be incorporated into their um, claims because guess what? They had to define over that prior art to get their claim. So if there's a way for your device to practice that, again, make certain that it is freely available and then you're not avoiding one patent by falling for another patent. So there's definitely a lot of gamesmanship here, a lot of strategy that goes into a design. Of it. But if you're going to play the prior art game, you have to do it exactly, and you need to make certain that it is actually out in the universe and it's not proprietary in someone else's path or path. Omit a limitation. How do we do that? If there's five of them, we only want to have four of you. And again, I'm saying this, guys, you look at these elements and you can break them out in sub-elements and some parts. But what we have to do is to remember that from all the elements and all the independent claims, we have to be missing at least one step or one element. All the independent claims, whether they're in two patents, one patent, five patents, and we have to be missing an element from every single one. Um, you know, Jeremy Stiptala, my colleague that's helping with this, he'll tell you that one of the first things you do, you map out the claims, guys. You figure out what's in it. What are all the elements? What does it say the elements have to do? That's where you start with the design of it. We don't go to the lab. You know, we don't start hammering on prototypes. We figure out what it is in these particular claims and what can we do differently. Um, I've had clients do this specifically to um, help rectify supply chain problems. 
you know, pre-COVID, and this is a great example of that, because in COVID, everything got a little wonky, and everything was a little hard to find at the time, and toilet paper and paper towels. But what I'm telling you is this, is that pre-COVID, I had a client who said, look, we're ordering the part from these guys, and they've got a patent on this particular part ordering, so we can't make that part, but they're like, we need to do something because they're not meeting our demand. You know, we've got to get out X units a day. These guys can't get us anywhere close to X units of their parts. So the client sat down. The other party had three patents. We looked at the independent claims on every single patent. The dependents, again, guys, those don't matter. You want to avoid the independent claims. If you avoid the dependent claims, whoopee dippy. but if you're not avoiding the independent claims, you're infringing. And so we looked at all of those, went down, met with the client, and we literally tore apart the devices, looked at them, and said, what can we do? And we had a couple engineers in the room, and by the end of that day's meeting, the engineers had some good ideas. And it turns out we ended up following a patent on the new concept because it improved over how the previous one worked, it was easier to build, and it was simpler to machine. And so that our clients being sort of put into a, a crunch as far as availability, the next thing you know, they've now taken a quantum step in innovation and made a better product because they simply couldn't get their hands on the product they were using before. Again, a perfect reason to design around. Now, what I want y'all to do here is to realize that if we have pending related applications, we don't want to go ringing the bell to the other guys. You know, we don't send them a fruit basket going, hey, I designed around your patent. We probably don't carry out a YouTube uh, promotional slogan going, we designed around. Because if they have a pending application, they may be able to file new claims. So what I'm telling you on this is that there's pending apps. Remember that at the beginning. Pending application, it's alive, it's out there. It's got the ability to raise trouble. And what we want to know is that when we have these pending applications out there, we have to watch them. We have to look how those claims are being handled. We need to see if there are new patents filed off of them. We need to see if something happens so that this pending application becomes a thorn in our side. We want to just keep an eye on that at all times. Now, when we're doing this, guys, and this is just like I told my client to do, we filed our own patent application. Once we figured out a new way to fix that particular uh, widget that we were missing, we filed patent on it. And then, if the other side ever comes to knock and or says, hey, problem, problem, we've got the ability to license it out to them, maybe do horse trade and say, hey, you let me do yours, I'll let you do mine. There are a lot of ways that this uh, patent IP, and we'll talk about this in next week's um, session, there are a lot of ways to help value your IP. There are a lot of ways to help build value in it. A design around is a great way, because if you're going to all the effort to avoid somebody else's product, and we're confident that, hey, you're not infringing it, you really need to protect it for yourself, because you may have made the next quantum leap that other people will want to try to copy. So remember this, when we do a design around, we almost always want to create our own intellectual property out of it. We want to protect it. We want to make certain that we know going in that, hey, you know, if we figure out a way around this bad boy, we want to protect it. We don't want to be in a situation where we fail to take advantage of this, we sell it, and then a year later, everybody can do it. You know, we don't want to lose that particular advantage. Now, here are the ways, let's say that you can't design around. This is just an insurmountable device that is so simple and elegant that there's just nothing we can do to avoid these claims, guess what? You may want to reach out to the person for a license and say, hey, you know, we would like to negotiate something, we pay a royalty for parts, and then you can work it out. You can say, hey, maybe we're in this vertical, you're in that vertical, we would like to use yours in this vertical, but we can help you in your vertical, um, or buy the patent. Patents are just like a piece of property, folks, just like our cell phones, just like a car, just like a new you can sell them, you can buy them, you can trade them, you can lease them, you can license them. Uh, another thing, if you've really got just a lot of cash out there, let's say that you're the Elon Musk of this company, you can go buy the other patent owner. Because when you buy the owner, if they still own the patent, you get that too. But typically, most folks would probably look at a license to resolve this. And again, I suggest that you do look at that. If you're saying, hey, I can't design around this blasted thing, no matter how hard I try, then reach out to the other party with a license. Do not take that self-help step of going ahead and making it anyway, because trust you me, if they see that you're making their device, they'll find you. And it's just the nature of the world nowadays. The internet tells all to everyone. So do not think, hey, you know, this is just tough to do. It is hard homework. It is something we have to work at, but we absolutely don't want to do anything that would potentially land us in an infringement law. 
Now, let's look at how to design around. Okay, this is claim one, guys. And like I said, we know it's an independent claim because it doesn't mention cl another claim number anywhere in it. And what we want to do is take and map this bad boy out. We're saying, hey, we've got a system for testing the tire for leaks. I'm like, okay, let's see what it's in it. Well, there's an air compressor. And guess what? There's a containment vessel for the top. And there's securing clamps to hold the top. There's hosing to connect the air pressure to the tire and to introduce pressure into the tire. There's a leak detection device that visually detects leaks. And there's a leak detection indicator spread over an outer surface of the tire that bubbles when a leak occurs. So you're looking at this right now, and your head's swimming a little bit. And that's okay, it should be swimming. Because what we want to do is to figure out, hey, what can I do that this other one doesn't do? Now here's its roadmap, just like that quote said, the invention is what the claim says it is, and no more. You know, we're not going back to the description and reading things in, we're not going out to other uh, patent applications that aren't involved in this one, and we aren't going out to particular encyclopedias and bringing in new things. Whatever the device is, is this claim. Again, we're making it very simple, one simple claim. But what we want to do is to figure out, hey, you know, can I get away with not using securing clamps? You know, is there a way to possibly tie it down? Is there a way to maybe frictionally place it in the engagement that won't require a clamp? You know, is there a way that maybe I can fix this tire without introducing pressure? That one might be a crazy one. You know, it may be impossible to make certain you've done a good job without having pressure. You might be like, nope, so that I can't really look at doing away with that. You might look at the next one and say, hey, you know, this leak detection system that they use visually detects the leaks. And part of that being the bubbles that we see from that surface spread all over. But is there a way that you can do it the audio? Maybe you listen for the leak. And you know, maybe you do it with something that senses an air pressure movement somewhere around the body of the tire to say, hey, there's a leak. There's an air pressure column coming out at some angle, at some pressure that shouldn't be coming out. So there are definitely ways we can think about, hey, how do we read around these claims? How do we work around them? How do we make a device that doesn't do what that claim says has to happen? Um, also, maybe we don't spread a leak detection indicator over an entire outer surface of it. You know, what we do is maybe we use something that is not a leak indicator. You know, maybe we have something that doesn't spread. Maybe we've got something like a little polyethylene sheet that we can put on it. You can see it bubble. Or you'll see the interaction of the air on the surface. You know, maybe you use something that, um, is just completely different than what they've done. Slap some silly putty on it. Watch it react. You know, but the next one will be, hey, don't use something that bubbles. You know, you've got a lot of options. Now we go back to this claim and you read it and you're like, wow, there's a lot of stuff in here. But really what we want to do is to figure out what of that stuff isn't really needed for our device. Do some of these work? You know, maybe the introduction of pressure is a non-starter. We can't do anything with that, so we don't bother with it. But maybe we can do it without the plant. Maybe we don't have a visually detected system. Maybe we have auditory. Maybe we have temperature. Maybe we have airflow. You know, maybe we don't spread a leak detector. Maybe we don't use something that bubbles. We've got to take those claims for what they say. And that's how we design around them. Now, here's some strategies that don't work, guys. And I hear these all the time. Folks will be like, hey, I've got an invention. And I know that somebody's doing something, but I've added something to it. The problem is, you don't want to have a design around that adds to what's there. You want a design around that doesn't have all the elements of those claims. You want to take something away, not add to it. Um, also, people will try to come in and say, look, you know, this patent wants it shaped this way. I've shaped it this way. But if you still have the same elements as that patent, then no matter what order you put them in or what order you hope that they put them in, that's not going to work. If you still have those elements in there, just trying to reorganize the same structure by phrasing it differently or maybe having it connected differently won't work if that patent doesn't require that specific structure in that specific order. Um, guess what? You'll have people come in all the time and say, hey, I know claim one's out there, but I'm definitely not infringing claim two. The bad thing is, though, is that claim two says the widget of claim one, meaning if you infringe uh, claim one, you've got all the elements in that claim, it doesn't matter if you don't infringe dependent claim two. That's why I told you those are just there for kind of hoots and giggles. Because you can say I don't infringe a dependent claim, but if you infringe the independent claim, it doesn't matter. You're already trapped and you're looking at the wrong situation. So remember, you can't add an element to an existing element. That doesn't matter. You're still using what's claimed. You just added something else to it. You can't reorganize the structure unless it is required to be structured in a specific way. 
nor can you say, look, I don't infringe a dependent claim, therefore I'm scot-free. It's all of the independent claims. You've got to avoid every single one. If we're looking at one patent, let's say it's a big one that has five independent claims, if we only avoid four of those, we still infringe the fifth. And that's what we need to understand is this is an all or none game. We have to avoid every single independent claim. Now, our design around strategies, guys, what we want to do is to figure out, hey, you know, what can we do here? What have we done? What do we want from this situation such that we are confident on the other end that we're not going to get sued for one print? And again, you might get a letter, but somebody is getting sued. Now, I'm thinking some good groups like Monster Energy Group. They send out cease and desist to everybody that even thinks about Monster Energy, that color green, or drink in the same sense. They literally just track them down their sleep. But what I want y'all to know is that today is, guess what, how significant are the changes we make? You know, if we have taken and made like a quantum leap, if we've looked at it and done something differently, there you go. But if it's some sort of little minor tweak, you know, maybe there's just this little bitty element in there and we change the way it works, we've got to be worried about that, uh, the doctrine behind us. We need to be very concerned that, hey, you know, what I've done is a good change. Is something that A, I think I can get a patent on, and B, when I do make widgets from this patent, it's not going to read on the other patent. Now, one thing I think is just brilliant, guys, is if you are looking at a design around, go to the prior art of the patent that you're looking at, and go look at the prosecution history of that patent. Because if you can go in there and find ways that patents that were cited against that patent, and I know I'm using patent a thousand times, but the way prosecution works is that a patent examiner will pull out other patents and they will tell the uh, patent application owner, hey, I think these have, this is too similar, I think your device is already encompassed by this one. And what Jeremy and I do is we have a conversation with that examiner to explain, no, those parts aren't here, here's why. Maybe we amend the claims to say, hey, no, our claim is not like these, look at what I've added to it to further prove that, or, in the case of a design arrangement, we look at what's been done before and we look at what was cited against that other patent. Because if we can do it the way of those patents, we're back in the prior art. And granted, make certain that if you're doing it the way of another patent, that that patent is expired because you don't want to avoid one patent and then stumble inadvertently into infringing another. So we do want to maintain that, hey, preferably the patent that you're typing you never issued as a patent or it's already expired or gone abandoned. But you don't want to take and avoid patent one by doing patent two, and patent two still being an uh, existing, living, pending application or an issued patent that you need to be careful of. So what I'll tell y'all is there are a lot of options to do this. The big thing, though, is to sit down and tear apart those claims, guys. You just want to go through this with a fine-tooth clone. You want to go through each portion of it. You want to look at it. I end up removing so that my widget is not like their widget. And guys, this was the end of my presentation, but I am open to any and all questions that you have. Today. And I will stop sharing the screen so we can all see each other again as soon as I find that button. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. That was fantastic. Appreciate it. Now I need some questions from the audience. <laughs> Uh, so we can continue to keep Doug on his toes. If not, I'm going to have to make one up. <laughs> Come on, Gatlin. Come on, LaShonda. Somebody's got a question. Rochelle, somebody has to have a question. Well, um, well. Also, ahead, excuse me, if you have not placed your name in the chat box to confirm your attendance, if you could please do so now. And also a reminder, all of those in attendance will receive a post-event survey at the end of the Zoom webinar. And those that respond to the post-event survey will receive the presentation slides. So, Tony, take it away. Well, while folks are thinking about a question, I'll just, uh, I'll pose one to Doug. So when someone comes to you with an idea, uh, an invention, and they want to, they, they think it's the best thing since sliced bread, and of course they all do, of course, and they want to file a patent application, what would you, what's your, your, your suggestion um, to that, uh, uh, to that inventor in terms of determining whether or not there might be something else out there that 
might infringe, you know, his idea. Sure. You know, Tony, that's a great question. And it's weird. You see a spectrum of inventors. You will have some who have gone on and guys, I know this sounds crazy, but Google patents and your patent office website or your friends. Jump on there and search. You know, if your invention is a new weed eater, go find out what weed eaters are out there. You know, find out if you think, hey, my weed eater functions differently. There are things that you can do. There are systems that we can use like Google patents. Go on there, search it. Go to the SPTO. The PTO is a little more esoteric. You know, you need to learn how the coding systems work, but it takes word searches as well. And once you start doing those, understand that, hey, just because your idea is awesome doesn't mean that you're in a vacuum because there's inventors all over the planet who might have something similar to that. But Tony brings up an awesome point because before we go down the I mean, primrose path of getting a patent, I don't want to file a patent application for you that we might not get because, hey, here's a piece of dead-on art that is exactly like you. We want to know what's out there, how have we changed it, and it can be a nuanced change, guys. It doesn't have to be, hey, my weed eater is a flamethrower. It can just be that, hey, Maybe the line trimming system that I've got online functions differently because I've oriented the blades in a way nobody's ever thought of doing before. You know, where I've got some sort of offset blade configuration that works so much better. Let me show you the math on it. What we don't want to do is to guess. You know, if you go to a patent attorney and say, hey, I want to file a patent on this, there's some who will just go out and do it. They won't search, they won't ping you on this stuff. But we need to make certain that you're comfortable knowing that, hey, this costs money. It is very slow. You know, if Jeremy and I can make it faster, we would. We can't. Because it takes sometimes years just to have a discussion with my office. You don't want to wait years down the road and realize, hey, we should have searched. Now, one thing, Tony, that's a great advantage is a patentability system. I, I use Cardinal IP. I've used these guys for close to 15 years now. They're awesome. They do a good flat piece search. They've got very specific algorithmic software. You can tell them, I give them a description of what the patent is. You know, you, the better the description, the better the result. And they'll search it for you. And you'll get back 20, 30 patents. And you go through them. And I like to use a grading system, the ABC. And A's are the patents we need to be worried about. B's are patents that, hey, this is kind of a cool idea. Maybe we should look at incorporating some of this. Or C are just things that don't apply to us at all and we shouldn't worry about. But if one is looking at that, guys, you need to have a good background understanding of what is around your invention in that field. With that, you come up with better quality patents because, hey, you can address those. You can say, hey, I'm not like this weed eater because of X. I'm different from this weed eater because of Y. But if you don't do the homework, you hamstring yourself in a very bad way. Very good. I, I agree with you 100%. So related to what the my question uh someone asked later on um who could actually help with the actual search and obviously i think you guys uh jeremy and doug are more than happy to help with that that search uh uh exercise correct sure absolutely and uh, guys i'm looking at some of the others there's a good question up here say hey now that we're first to file um, would that also include adding more claims to the filed but not issued patents to ruin my design around? Yes, that is exactly what I meant by that. Is that if they have a pending application, they can take and add claims to it. Let's say that they've got a weed eater. We've done our weed eater. And we love the way that our weed eater functions and we like it. And we said, hey, we've designed around you. That's why we need to be very careful and watch theirs. Because let's say it's somebody massive like um, weed eater itself or um, you know, one of the Johnny come lately, but Toyo or somebody to the industry. We want to watch their patent applications because they may see our device and try to patent over it to force us to get a license. And you're absolutely right. The first to file system guys is in place, meaning that they beat you to the patent office and that application is existing before yours, it can be used against you and it might be used against you in infringement if claims that cover your device issue. So related to that is the prior art someone's asked is the prior art defined by the last issued patent or what is on the market that is uh, it's a great question prior art guys is anything that's out there it can be devices on the market it can be magazines it can be youtube videos it can be patent applications it can be issued patents from 1902 any of that can count as prior art it is basically what came before and even though it might be an appending application that beats you by a day if it's in your industry and pertinent to your device then it can be prior art. And so that is a very broad definition of it, but it encompasses a whole lot of material. And as the internet increases, 
you're going to see a lot more of these results of an examiner going out and maybe not hitting you with a patent, but hitting you with a video or hitting you with a printed off excerpt from a website that nobody thought to patent, but seems like your invention. So it's important that we understand the background of our invention before we file, because trust me, examiners do a good job most of the time searching these out. Yeah, here's a good question, I think. Also, can you enlighten us how various automobile companies come up with the same sort of device, such as the ability to open up the back hatch door with your, with your foot? I'm sure, sure everyone knows what, I'm, what now, that that's is. That's a great question, guys. Several ways that happen. They may all be sharing the same patent. You know, Tony Del Campo may have figured out, hey, if I put a little IR beam underneath the bumper of a car, somebody moves their foot under it, boom, up comes the hatch. So if you're all like me, you've got to get it in one load. You can't make multiple loads. You've got to get everything at one time. So you're sitting there balanced on your foot, and it might be the, gen the genius Tony Del Campo who designed this, and all of these different cars uh, companies use that same one that they license from. Uh, it could also be an industry standard device. Sometimes the industry will come about and say, hey, we think this is a good device for the industry. We're going to donate this to kind of, quote, unquote, the common good, even though people still have to pay for it. They can hit you with that and say, look, you know, this will be a shared technology for all of us. Kind of like Europe demands that all cell phones have the exact same type of charger. You know, as an Apple fan or an Android owner that aggravates the crap out of us in the U.S., that's not a problem in Europe because there's an industry standard charger outlet. Let me hold up the phone to show you what I'm talking about. You know, I've got an Apple. You guys can see this little funky rectangle. But guess what? Europe says you can't have a difference between an iPhone and an Android, an iPhone and a Nokia, an iPhone and a Sprint phone. They've all got to have the same thing. Could be that for this device. Also, simply, guys, they may work different ways. One of them may have an optic beam. One of them might be AR. One of them may be a motion detector. One of them may be a vibration detector. They could be different devices. So you'd really want to tear them apart and say, hey, you know, what's Toyota's device as compared to Nissan's device as compared to Ford's device? Because once you see what those are, it might be a shared collaborative effort, all draining from a simple patent Tony developed. It might be parallel paths where they said, nope, I don't want an IR beam, I want an optic. Or, I don't want an optic, I want an air freshener. Could be very different devices that accomplish the same result. That's true. And I think a lot of people don't realize, like, for example, in the automobile industry, there's a lot of cross licensing. Absolutely. And, and, and I don't, I'm, I'm not familiar uh, of this particular situation, but we all know that they operate pretty much the same way. It may be that there's a, a circuit in there or a design which everybody just licenses from someone external and they put it in their car because they got to have it to keep up with the, the other manufacturer. You know what I mean? So you know, that's a great point because sometimes the market does drive sort of like a bottleneck. You know, you're there and you're like, hey, my minivan's coming out and all of a sudden I see Toyota will do this. You've literally made to slap down the money for that license. But meanwhile, you may have, <clears throat> excuse me, you may have the engineering corps looking at the device, figuring out a better way to do it, a cheaper way to do it, or a different way to do it so that you can claim some market share on that. So any other questions from the audience? So we're, uh, we've got plenty of time here. Um, you know, one of the things that I might add, especially uh, coming from a scientific point of view, uh, and which is most of the kind of patents that I work with, that th what a patents, a patent attorneys will do is in order to make, to maybe change a little bit from one patent to another so that they're not infringing, it may, it may be something as simple, and generally it's not, <laughs> but it could be something as simple as, say, changing the concentration of the of the formula that you're that you're interested in. and it may do the same thing or look like it does the same thing but you change it a little way in some ways say the concentration of a particular component in that formula and all of a sudden now you know you're you're not infringing presumably but you still maintain the functionality as you pointed out yeah and tony that's an awesome point because a lot of times you know folks i'll, I'll hammer these suckers in the ground but i think legal zoom all of these online patent companies are terrible. They do too narrow of a job. If you come to me or Jeremy, one of the hardest parts of our job is to think on how to broaden your invention. Because if we follow that on, let's say that you bring me in a device that is a nutcracker and it's got two prongs on it and it's got a little malleable end and it's also got a pick on it, I want to expand that out. I want to be able to phrase that as broadly as I can. Even though your device might be very simple, 
what our job is as a patent attorney is to describe it very broadly. And like Tony said, you sometimes see people who don't do that, like LegalZoom and these online groups guys, they're terrible, they're terrible. I don't care if it's slander, they're slander proof because they usually do a very poor job and they focus very narrowly on your invention. You don't want that. You want good, broad claims, which sometimes makes a design around hard, but it also makes your device even better if you get a good, broad claim. Absolutely. Let's see here. Uh, another question. Uh, is it true that a patent attorney would construct a huge and expansive fence around the patent claims to discourage others to circumvent it? And actually, I think you, you were just discussing that. It is, guys. And remember, too, that, you know, we can't claim the universe. We have to claim what's out there. And that's why having a good background knowledge of what your weed eater is like or your new invention is like or your new PPE device is like. If we know what's out there in our universe, we can know how far to claim. Jeremy, and I'll tell you, hey, you want a good rejection on the first one. Because if you get a first office action, down. So, yes. A good patent attorney is going to try to press that out, and you're going to get a rejection. That aggravates the devil out of clients. So like, why did this get rejected? I'm like, that's a good thing. Because if we made it too narrow, it may be so freaking narrow that it doesn't really prevent anybody from being on a good, broad claim that coexists with what's out there. You know, maybe you've got a state-of-the-art device. There's nothing else like it. That's awesome. Let's claim that as broadly as possible. But if you're in a field where other devices exist, you want to push up to the boundaries of the closest, the other devices that are closest to us. Absolutely. And a lot of people, I'm sure, as you pointed out, uh, they'll go uh, file a patent and they find out that their first office action, all the claims, or many of them have been, uh, uh, been dismissed, rejected, and that causes the inventor to become it reject the, rejected, you know? So, um, but that's the way it works. And that, that's how you guys earn your keep by going back and forth with the patent examiner to make sure that uh, uh, they were not rejected unnecessarily or without some well, merit. You know, and it's so important to get that point across because, you know, Jeremy and I can tell folks, hey, it's expensive and it's long and there's these huge periods of absolutely no activity. But understand too is that we have to take the examiners as they're dealt. They're good examiners and they're not good examiners. And it really, a good examiner makes cases so simple. They're awesome. They're there to help you, and they're bad examiners. And again, I don't, I'm not naming names or anything, but trust that when Jeremy and I say, hey, these examiners can be very different from one form to the other, we mean it sincerely. Someone asked a question, um, how do you protect a software algorithm? That is an awesome question. And Anta, is that you? I think it is. It came up under your question. But I, here's a couple things to think about. A, do we want a patent? You know, Jeremy Stipkala talked about in week one that, hey, there are two different ways out there that you might protect an invention. You might file a patent on it, or you may keep it a trade secret. Also remember, too, that for a software algorithm, copyright comes into play. So there may be multiple layers of protection that we can put on this. I'll tell you this, if it's for just an application or something like that, Filing an application on those is usually disfavored. The computer arts are very, very slow to get to the application. At one point, it was four years. I think it's a little under that now, north of three years, six months. But guys, that's a long time in app world. Because if you look at your phone right now, you know, other than your basic apps like Gmail and all this stuff that you see the same logo for, you're probably not using those same apps. And I assure you, if they're multiple years old, they're not running on the same software they started. So a software algorithm, it may be behooving up to us to avoid patenting it for a couple reasons. You know, we're not telling everybody about it. For the copyright, we can actually just file truncated versions of it. We don't have to give the whole thing away. And also for the trademark, uh, trade secret version of it, is that, hey, we know how it works. We know what it does, and we've got the efficiency. If we draft a patent on that, we've got to explain it to everybody. It literally will publish after 18 months, and everybody and their uncle can look at it. And if we don't get a patent, then Katie bar the door, everybody can use it. Absolutely. And the other thing, uh, if I may add, and please, uh, Doug, comment on it is uh, with regard to software, mm -hmm. <clears throat> is the fact that there's so much code out there already in the public domain. That's right. And if, if someone comes up with an algorithm which is utilizes uh, some of the code, even a little, one line is my understanding anyway, uh, uh, in that in that algorithm, that could be uh, prior art and cannot be patented then. 
you know, Tony, you hit that on the head. Open source to me, and it's so funny. I saw an advert today. The Open Source Symposium is coming back to Columbia here in the summer. You know, whether it does in person or not, probably a better question. But guys, open source is to be avoided. I realize it's a quick fix. I realize you can get it in the package. But Tony's dead on, guys. If you go to a venture capitalist or a funding source and say, hey, here's my product, you know, they're going to be oohed and awed by it. But within the first five minutes, they're going to say, okay, who's your code? Where did this come from? Because Tony's dead on. If you use even small excerpts of open source code, you're under an obligation to share that back to the public. The use of this gives whatever you create back. I don't think most of us are okay with that. Even though open source is kind of the chief, and guys, I heard some terrible comments, and this is back when we used to go to these things in person. I was at a CLE in Charlotte, and some engineers were there, and they were laughing at how often open source code is used and not told to the owner who said, go design something. And again, this is just kind of their internal joke, but we don't want to be part of the punchline. We want to have our own software. We do not want to have open source code in there that critically undermines your ownership of it. And that's getting harder and harder as mm -hmm. more software is becomes open source, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Anybody? Well, let's see. Um, Doug, you have, uh, there's one other slide that talks about the reminder for next week's. Absolutely. Let me share that out. Everybody, please be certain to attend this one. And as I share my screen with you. Here you go. You want to tell them about that one, Tony? Sure. Um, I just, this is just a, a reminder for everyone that next week uh, we'll have our fifth session, uh, which is about intellectual property management. We'll talk about uh, from the company's perspective, you know, what are, Again, what are the, some of the considerations regarding when to file a patent and in what countries? These are very important questions. And learn about the importance of timing as both Jeremy and Doug know that timing is everything in patents, <laughs> both uh, during, before you file and even during the filing process. So that's gonna be discussed. And uh, very importantly is how do you manage the patent related costs? Because obviously this is a business, although it's necessary, uh, for a successful business that is filing patents, but is also very expensive. And so it's important that companies try to find ways to manage those, those costs. So please uh, tune in for next week. That'll be Tuesday, February 16th. And um, you should already have an uh, in your mailbox um, where to register. Uh, there's a little button that you click. Uh, but if not, um, if, uh, Carolyn, if you don't mind, I'm going to impose on you that they can contact you and uh, you can uh, help them register for next week's program. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also, um, again, everyone that has confirmed their attendance today will receive a post-event survey. If you could please respond to that post-event survey we in turn will send out um, Doug's presentation slides from today. Great. So again, thank you everyone for joining today. I, I certainly, uh, we certainly appreciate it. I'll speak for the entire team. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. And if you have any questions, please feel free uh, to give us a call or send us an email. Absolutely. Everybody Absolutely. have a good day. Take care all. Thank you.